Hola, audiencia, y bienvenidos a We Dimelo Cinema Club. I am tonight's host, Jason Ishmaelekos, and I am joined, of course, by my illustrious panel of co-hosts, Don Dino Spazzini, Steve Dez TV, <laughs> and uh, Marina. Uh, watch, eat, what is it, Marina? Watch, eat, it'll come up soon. Tonight we are reviewing the 1974 film The Conversation starring Gene Hackman. Uh, I think it's 1970. I'm not, don't don't hold me on that, but it's the 1970s film starring Gene Hackman. Um, let's just jump straight into uh, first impressions of this movie. Um, I, You know what? I, I'd like to hear from Marina first in the new year. Why don't you send us into the new year, Marina? Ooh, okay. 1974, just to help you out there. At the, Thank um, you. So yeah, my first impression was like, here goes Jason with these old movies. But um, then I started it, <laughs> and it was actually it was actually really surprisingly mystical. I don't know how to describe it. Like, I didn't really understand what was going on. Like, I knew what he was doing for a living, but it was just hard to kind of figure out what was going on with this couple. Like, there was just a lot of like, it kept it kept you wondering, like what is this? What's so serious about these tapes? So I like movies that kind of do that for me where I'm like 10 seconds away from wikipedia the answer because I'm like so suspenseful. I'm like, what is going on here? So I liked, um, it was a really good movie. I liked the um, the score. I really liked the music. It was just a lot yep. of cool things. And then a lot of cool people. It kind of feels like maybe some of their first roles too, to where you're like, oh, wow. They look really young in this, so um, definitely a good older movie pick from Jason that I actually really liked. <laughs> it's not knew, in black and white. <laughs> I knew I like yeah. you here and there. I'm gonna get you. You got me. <laughs> but that's All my right, first Steve, how about you? First impression. First impressions. Uh, this movie, same thing. Like I, I came in with the mindset of like, what is this old movie going to be about? Let's see. But uh, it took me on a wild ride. And what I did really enjoy specifically about this movie is that it just kept your intrigue because it was just this conversation. And I was constantly until literally the final parts of the movie i was just like what does this all mean like what what is this all about so i did like the the tie of the bow at the very end you know filling you in with everything because i was like if this movie ends without explaining this i am going to absolutely destroy my television right now so uh yeah so it was it was very a very fun movie definitely would have gone under my radar if it wasn't for Cinema Club and for Jason. Uh, and uh, definitely Jason is obsessed about phone conversations and recordings and stuff as of late, <laughs> based on the telemarketing documentary that you recommended me one time and stuff like that. So definitely, well, definitely keen to discuss this even further. So those are my first impressions. All right, right on, right on. Um, all right, Dino, why don't you uh, follow up with that? Oh. Well, mind. I guess I was the only one who had seen this movie before, um, which I can't remember if I saw it in Paraguay or once I came to the U.S. So there were some scenes that, you know, we ended up watching it together, and I was just like, this is the scene I remember. There were, like, three specific parts in the movie that I was just like, it, it like, burned into my mind of just amazingness. And one of them is the sound, like, for it to like a breathe, this movie just breathes throughout. It's like you don't have to hear them having dialogue. There doesn't have to be a, a whole lot of action. Uh, like I was telling Jason, it really gave me a lot of Enemy of the State vibes, especially since also Gene Hackman is there and it's about surveillance and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I just really enjoyed this movie the first time I saw it. I don't even remember how I stumbled it. I think I was on a Gene Hackman. Uh, I tend to do this, especially earlier. No, that's a lie. I still do this. 
but I'll, I'll, I'll like uh, hitch my wagon onto like an actor or a director or a composer, and I'll just be like bang out like five of the movies that they've worked out. I mean, Jason can attest to that either Kurosawa or Toshiro Mifune or Ennio Morricone or. You know, I, I've done it before with Scorsese, and I'm pretty sure I did it with Gene Hackman also, because I this is not a very well known movie. But then you have like Harrison Ford in it. You have you have a lot of people of the the Godfather that are in it. So if you if you're a Godfather fan, there's a lot of crossover there, and I believe it's because Coppola was a producer on this or executive producer was one of those things. Director. Oh, did he have a director? It's okay. A the movie. Yeah, oh, okay. Well, I didn't even think of that. But, yeah, so I really enjoyed... I enjoyed the movie the first time I saw it, and I definitely enjoyed it even more this time. It was like a fine wine, especially with nowadays with, you know, having your your phones and, and, and your watch. Like, you can talk to people on your watch and stuff like that. So it's just like this whole surveillance kind of situation and recording. And, and they just built on tension. They just built on tension. And, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the movie. Awesome. Very cool. Um, great. I'll just jump into uh, my first take, and then we can get some conversations going about all the different uh, themes in this movie because there's a lot of them. And you got to drink every time conversation is, is said. Right. So uh, this is my first time ever seeing this movie. I picked it randomly for you guys. It's on simply, it's on the 1001 list. And I wanted something that I thought was from the 70s. So that's as far as I went. This is the movie that came up that looked the most interesting. And when I looked at the poster, I was like, is that Gene Hackman? I was like, oh, wait a second. I was like, that is Gene Hackman. We'll watch this. Uh, so I'm really happy I got to this movie. I did not know that Francis Ford Coppola had directed it until the movie started. And then, you know, it says it, you know, in the opening title screen. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't know this. This movie's wedged right in between, uh, the two Godfather movies. So this is something he was working on, like, while he was working on Godfather, essentially. Um, and, and starring, uh, John, uh, Cazale in it, which this is only his third movie. And this is my third time ever seeing him. And it's like, you know, it's kind of sad watching it a little bit as well. Like for a guy that was probably like past before I was even born, but he was such a talent. And I would have loved to have seen him have the same kind of careers that like Pacino and De Niro and the rest of those guys had. But what three movies? The Godfather movies, mm -hmm. Dog Day Afternoon. And this. Deer Hunter. Oh, Deer Hunter. Yeah, yeah. That was it. Those were the movies. Was that Qua four? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Not the, unless you count the Godfather sure. movies, you know. One, right. Two, three, four. I got sorry that it's been stickler there. Okay. Um, awesome. No, you're right. But anyway, so that was kind of like awesome to see him because I've kind of been waiting to see this. This is the only performance of his I hadn't seen, so I was kind of really excited about it. And then, like Marina says, this thing comes in with such an impactful score, like the music just hits you right away, and you're like, "Whoa!" Like this is this is a thing that's about to happen because this music is on point. And then, like it, it immediately takes me into like this place of like loneliness, like. You know, the movie is as much about spying on people and, you know, building tension as it is about, like, dealing with your own self and loneliness and, you know, he, uh, your own insecurities as well. He's a pretty insecure guy. There's lots of things in this movie that makes him feel, like, not really, like, the hero. You know what I mean? And this is kind of like those, one of those gritty 70s pictures that, they unfortunately, they don't make a whole lot of this anymore unless it's closer to maybe something that, like, this will be an A24 movie today. Because uh, it's dealing with a lot of different themes and it's very layered and textured. And, you know, obviously Gene Hackman's so good, you forget, like, you're watching him sometimes. He's just, he pulls you right in. He's just, he's always been Gene Hackman. He's, I've never seen him be other than awesome in anything. Um, yeah, the movie's got a lot of stuff going for it. I, I really liked it, just like straight off rip. Um, it kind of takes a little bit of time to, like, to think about too and it's definitely a movie like before we even do a final thought it's definitely a movie that's like worth watching again and reviewing again because there are some things bouncing around in that movie and interesting camera work too so let's just get right into like characters that we've uh identified with pretty early on in the movie like i mean early on in the review uh who who did you guys like identify with or who did you like in this movie So, 
<clears throat> excuse me, I really liked Harry. Like, um, just like being like super type A in your work <laughs> to where you don't even feel like other people who do your work understand you. Like you're so serious about it. He's like losing friends and he's losing lovers because he just refuses to get out of his ways. Like, like that's super relatable because sometimes you feel like you're so good at something that you have to focus and nobody else understands. Like I just really loved how his character developed because at first I'm like, who's this guy? But you really start to see who he is and you see him in a vulnerable state. Um, so he was definitely my favorite. And then the um, strong second would have to be the promo model slash escort. I don't know what, what she was really all about, but I liked her personality too. She was really fun. Yeah, I, I liked her a lot too. Um, I mean, I like them both. But uh, the reason I, I wanted to jump straight into like who you guys liked is because there's so many characters in this thing and they're all so well defined. And it feels like me and Dino even mentioned it a couple of times, I think, uh, that it feels like a piece of theater sometimes with so many people like in one uh, like screen, like one section. And you're just kind of watching all these actors be really alive. Like the director put them all in one space together. And it's like everybody has to live in the moment together right now and do acting. And they all kind of did their own thing and they all brought their own life and energy. But, you know, I, I was thinking like these all feel like theater actors and most likely they were. I mean, that's why we get so many, like, clearly defined characters in this thing. Like, that 1970s acting is something else, man. Something else. It's some of my favorite times to watch acting at all. It's just, like, those people are, like, alive. They're not trying to be, like, winking at the camera or nothing. It's no, like, trying to be cute. It's like, let me just be a living, breathing person on the screen. And they're all doing great work. Yep. I'm going to say, for me... My favorite character had to be that uh, that salesman. That is such a Steve. The character. one from Queens. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I like him too. I think Steve is it. the salesman. <laughs> I'm the salesman. <laughs> <laughs> the best in the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, I think, he did a, I think he did a great job, and especially like just constantly thinking, like, we should partner up. We should make all this money He's from Uncle awesome. Sam. Like I, I think for the short period that he was on screen, he made definitely like a memorable stamp. Yeah, he definitely made an impression. What did you guys think about uh, catching a glimpse of Harrison Ford and Robert Duvall in this thing? Harrison Ford shocked me. I was like, oh, look at little, I guess, young Harrison Ford. <laughs> Even though he still looks old. <laughs> well, I think that's the youngest I've ever seen him. Because for a while, the youngest I had ever seen Harrison Ford outside of like um, the adventure one. Uh, American Graffiti? <laughs> no, the one that's like to this day, Indiana Jones. For a while, like that the was. Adventure one. <laughs> <laughs> like they literally just came out with a new movie of the adventure one. Yeah, I was really, I was in the theater like, why did they got this man jumping on trains at this age? But that's another story. Um, but for a while, like my younger Harrison Ford, but yeah, like, yeah, The Fugitive and. Um, the um, Fugitive and the young Harrison Ford. Because like when I started watching like adult movies and, you know, like that was like the youngest I really knew of him. So it was very interesting to see him playing like a, what, he had like five lines the whole movie. Like it was so interesting seeing him play such a small role. I was not expecting him to be that person. And then same thing. Robert Duvall has like five lines. Like what is the disrespect here? <laughs> I kind of felt like that too. I kind of felt like, hey man, like you got Robert Duvall in your movie. Use him. Like what? <laughs> I wonder if a lot of his stuff got edited out just because it was but I mean they're buddies, right? They were doing Godfather in between movies. I wonder if Coppola uh, asked Pacino and just wasn't available at that time, you know. Five years later, he was in Apocalypse Now. Yeah. And Harrison he, he, Ford was in Apocalypse Now as well. He's in Godfather. Yeah. So he did he worked with him in three movies like back back to back. I guess that makes sense why he brought back Harrison for Apocalypse Now, even though at that point he had already done Star Wars. You know. Well, anyway, I think we cut you off, uh, Marina. Was her? Oh, did we? 
maybe. No, I said what I had to say. I don't think we went over everybody's favorite characters, though, right? Uh, for me, I mean, favorite, you know, uh, I mean, probably is Gene Hackman. Just like he's ex he's so eccentric and just like can't get out of his own way. Uh, you know, even when he's trying, and then the moment that he kind of finally opens up, and it's to a stranger, right? It's to, like, he just met her, you know, and he finally opens up, and then they they were recording him and started, you know, as a prank, made fun of him. And that, I mean, that must be horrible feeling. So I, I felt that even just when I've been honest or I've done something with someone... And then, like, I turn around and go in the other room, and then they had already said, you know, they already found out what just happened. And I'm like, what that just, how they found out? You know, like, literally that happened, like, five seconds ago or whatever. So I I think Gene Hackman, just because, I mean, he has the mustache and the saxophone, what else he want? Sure. <laughs> Did anybody else um, automatically know that that's what was happening with the pen? No, it's it's hard for me to answer that because I I've already seen the movie, so I already oh. knew that that was what happening. Your first time. What about your first time? I, you don't remember. Was it like twenty years ago, maybe maybe more. What about you? Do you know? I you know that? Knew. And I knew. I think he knew ish. Like he he was trying to like I, again. I really love his character because I feel like he was trying to be a normal, and he was probably like, let me not. I think. I don't like people touching me, but let me be normal and accept this pin. And the one time he actually goes with the flow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, you're you're he didn't know it was a microphone, just that it was yeah. Yeah. That he, he just was, was like he probably stopped himself. Yeah. Because yeah, if you probably try not, about try it. not to be the, the weird one. Yeah, exactly. I would say like I definitely did not think of it, but I should have thought of it just because they made a, such a strong like emphasis on like look at him putting the pen in the pocket and mm. typically in film when you yep. show something like that there has to be like a payoff so they did show it yes they they made a i noticed that i definitely noticed that this time both on him and the other one and because i knew he, it was he, coming he and, was, and then he looked down for a second he actually looked down for a second it's yeah. like uh, Chekhov's gun, you know, like if you show something, even though clearly wasn't act one. But. but I think honestly, like it was it's it's a great scene because it kind of puts you on his perspective of like that happened. But then yeah. he's thinking about the tape. A lot of things are happening and stuff that you even forget of that pen stuff. So the same yeah. thing yeah. kind of happened. And maybe he noticed it at that moment, but then getting pulled to other places and hanging out and like right. all the stuff and the tape, he kind of forgot. And then when he got discovered, he was like, yo, what? Fuck you. <laughs> and I love the fact that, you know, again, like we, we, we have this, right. But like dude pulls out and it's like even bigger than this. And it has a little strip of, of, you know, film. But that made me feel film. weird. I was like, was that in his pocket the whole time? Yeah. <laughs> Like, was he recording somewhere else and then just pulled that out of his briefcase to do the reveal afterwards? Fits in your pocket. <laughs> it was very interesting seeing a trade show in that time. Like, I don't know if I was just ignorant to how long marketing like that has been going around, but <laughs> I was you just like, like trade shows in the 70s? I would have racked up so much dough doing those. But not only that, a spy trade show. Surveillance trade show. It yeah, wasn't. Yeah. You know, it, wasn't it, it still it still exists, bro. CES. Yeah. Yeah. C CES, like the electronics trade show. That's, yeah. that's what I thought it was. That it was part of that. Yeah, you said you, he has said the same thing. You said E three. Well, I, 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 I figured you meant that. I'm sorry. I don't know. So why that. do you guys think that they sell surveillance stuff at those the technology? Where do they have part of that? Where do they have ring and uh, the, all those doorbell cams now and stuff like that? It would yeah, I probably think like that show was specific to an art. Just like you can go to a gun show. I think that was more of like a um, a work profession focus, right? Yes. Like if you are in the field of 
spying on folks. Like, come here, we got the latest technology. Everybody but, knew him. He was like a celebrity there. Yep. I know. It's like I if you go to the Marriott, Marriott, am I saying that right? One day, and all of a sudden, it's like, what the hell is going on in the lobby? And they're like, oh, there's this uh, uh, surveillance, where, uh, you know, event going on. It was also pretty there. funny, too, like, when you think about it, like, how we haven't really changed, but now we have, like, just access to each other. He was like, can I take a picture of you holding our thing, our device? Like, now it's, like, posting it on Instagram. Like, where did he post right. that? Like, who would have known? Maybe he would have made, like, an ad or something, but it's just pretty yeah. funny. It's like, yeah, maybe you can use it. Use it for something and then come back and, and like, tell us and all that. And it's like, yeah. He said they wanted to put it in, like, a flyer or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Take this one with you. Like, see what you think. Like, he's like, nah. I do my own. Influencer marketing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, that guy was a legend in his field. Like, I mean, I don't know if he's a legend, but people knew him. Well, he was, I mean, he was because they were trying to figure out how he bugged the, the boat in the ocean. Yeah. And he wouldn't reveal it. So, like, it created, again, all that, I feel like, I do agree with, uh, was it Steve or was, did you say, Marina, at the end that they kind of actually showed it and, like, broke it down, kind of what it was? But um, they didn't bring up the boat thing. And I feel like a lot of modern days, if they're even talking about this boat, and because it is a PTSD, that's what made him move to the West Coast. No, wait. Yes, to the West Coast was because someone was killed in, in, due to the recording that he made, right? Um, multiple people were killed. And so I feel like the fact that it dealt with PTSD before that was even called PTSD, I believe. And... In today's day and age, I feel like we got to show that from the get go. We got to show a scene of the boat and we got to show a flashback of the people being killed and how he felt then. And this was all, that's why also like a stage play. It's all in the dialogue, the very little dialogue that there is, especially from him and and just the acting and the re reacting and, and why he's become so private. And I, it's just... Yeah, it, it's, it was so well done. It's like a master class of acting, I feel like. Every character was so strong. There were so few speaking roles, and everyone knew what they were there for. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with all that. Um, yeah, it's all very noticeable. Uh, what was I about to say? Do you guys... Uh... Well, oh, just something I kind of kept thinking about was the costumes. What do you guys think about like those 1970 costumes and some of the things that some of the actors were wearing? Because I got some questions. Like one, was that Gene? Was that a raincoat Gene Hackman was wearing in the end? That that floaty little jacket he had on. It was throwing me off the whole. Every like two minutes, I was like, Jason, is that see through? Jason, is that a raincoat? <laughs> do you guys what? know what, what I'm talking about? No idea what you're talking about. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> you remember the raincoat that he was wearing, like in the final sort of act of the movie? He's wearing like a green, sort of gray colored raincoat. I did finally see it is a raincoat, and the reason why is the buttons. It's those weird little uh, click uh, plastic buttons and gotcha. raincoat stuff. So it's just a really nice uh, period appropriate raincoat. Okay, yeah, I've never seen a rank boat that looked that transparent that nice. before. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, also, also like uh, that guy's jacket, the salesman's jacket, the big purple jacket. I was thinking, would anybody be wearing that? I was like, well, I guess probably this guy would be wearing this. And it's 1970s. I didn't, like, and then, like, the one guy was like, you have a beautiful suit on. He really did have a beautiful suit yeah. on. I totally agree. Like, that's a beautifully tailored gray suit. It was it was a seventies movie where I didn't hate the fashion. Is what I'm saying. It was all it was kind of all over the place. Even like the ladies' fashion, it all kind of seemed a little bit appropriate. Yeah, I think this. Yeah, this jacket that he's That's wearing. That's a raincoat. It's that plasticky, fake plastic, whatever. That's yeah, it's like a plastic coat situation. Yeah. yeah. But right. it's cut like a like a three quarter length coat. Yep. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, the fact that you guys, just analyzing that scene, I'm like, wow, 
<laughs> look at those shots. It's just him. Most of the movie is just him walking. There's a lot of really slow shots in this movie. And and music. And and, and music. And like, right, the, there's there's chunks without dialogue. Yeah. And that says so much. Yep. Yeah. I agree with the feeling like a, a lot like a play. I feel like there's a lot of that like in plays where there's just this moment where they're by themselves and just looking off into the distance. And it was yeah. based off a book, right? Or Oh, was it? I don't know. I can't remember. I don't know. I'll check that out right yeah, now. We'll, we'll have our analysts get right on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anything else that you guys want to talk about this movie? Anything that weirded you out? Anything that you think might be um, that wouldn't necessarily like kind of throws you back? Like this movie's like 50, 50 years ago. Is there anything in this that's like, oh man, I, I forgot like when they picked up the weird phone or something? I would say like, <laughs> I would say, like one thing this movie did great was uh, definitely represent also the guilt he was feeling throughout the movie and then congruently tying that up with the fact that he's Catholic. Mm. Yeah, that was like, wild. Yeah. And it wasn't in your face. But again, you could tell from the little bits that they, I and mean, clearly he went to confession after three months. But just like they didn't like, beat it over your head you know just like he's you know he deals with this it just felt more normal and realistic like someone maybe was raised catholic but clearly his business is about something that is you know non non uh non uh non non very religious but then he goes back because he's also having um he's not married and having that you know devious sex life you know with ladies of the night and then the one girlfriend that he won't share a place with yeah his uh relationship with women in this thing was awful and telling and sad and but it also it wasn't that telling to be honest with you because you don't know why he's in such a, a weird place and and the the lady of the night that that relationship was kind of weird We've seen it before. You know, he kind of failed for his, you know, lady of the night girlfriend sort of deal. I don't know. But that was, I've never quite seen it handled like that before. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen it yeah. quite handled like that. So, but this movie's kind of dark too, though. So, not, it's not based on a book. The, it says, Francis Ford Coppola wrote the screenplay and after a conversation he had with Irvin Kirshner. And uh, he wrote it in the mid-60s but didn't release the movie after uh, shortly after Watergate scandal broke. Mm. Which makes a lot of sense. I mean, when the president... So gets, wait, when did he shoot it? Well, he wrote it in the mid-60s. But then didn't film it and you know release it to seventy four. Yeah. So years after Nixon got clipped. Yeah. I have two That's things. Funny. They didn't want to make a movie about surveillance, but maybe because that was all that was in the news at the time. Right. Like, are you trying to make a statement about surveillance and a miracle? Well, like, would people really believe it in the sixties? What would people would people need? But because then they're around the same time, I feel like there was a John Travolta movie about also recording and kind of recording things by accident and stuff like that mm. that came out that I've talked. Uh, it's called, um, I'll, I'll look it up. The Brian De Palma. Nice. <laughs> what did you say, Marina? The face off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> face off. The audio version. Ear <laughs> off. Um, did anybody not. Like, okay, Dino, I feel like you're kind of out of this because it was your, not your first time. But did any newbies feel like you thought something else was going down? Like, out of anything in the movie, I think what was being hidden was so minimal as to what I thought was about to go down. And I was yep. honestly a little disappointed until after. Yeah. What the, okay, <laughs> this is great because halfway through the movie, Jason, I got the plot. I know what's going to happen. I know the twist. Yep. So, Marina, what did you think I was going to be? 
so at first I thought it was your typical, like you said, the vibe of um the vibe of um enemy of state, right? Like something government cover up. Ooh, yeah, something's about to go down. These two people heard something, it's happening. Um, and then especially when he went in the elevator and the girl was there. I was like, shoot, she works for the company. She heard something. It's going down. <laughs> like, I just like, I really thought it was just something to where these two people knew something about the company and they, they needed to kill them. I was completely blindsided by what was really happening, especially but like, what's the secrecy? Like, why didn't the director want to meet with them at first? Like, it was just a lot of stuff that making me think like this was so, I thought they killed the director and like were taking over the company. My mind went in so many ways <laughs> that were completely wrong wrong um but i did think it was like a huge scenario not so much what it really was which was an affair but so. they did they did kill the director no no no. they killed him eventually i thought he was already dead oh like that's yeah. why he wasn't there to give him the money and stuff like right right right, like, right. yeah like and i have a follow-up with that too but what did you guys think um was going down i thought i thought the director was gonna be chewbacca <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh my god that would have been awesome okay. um that's how they so, met Harrison Ford and <laughs> I thought the direction of the movie was about to change dramatically I thought it was going to be like uh, he was going to up the mission or whatever by planting trying to get close enough to those people to plant a device on them um, once he had got a hold of that pin device I'm like oh the pin device he's going to go back and use that you know, for himself or whatever to accomplish this thing. And it didn't go in that direction at all. Um, it went where it went, which was awesome. And I didn't see any of that coming. And I really loved like sort of the beautiful texture they use with audio in this movie, like to go in and out of that sound for them. Like all that sound effect was kind of like really nice. And, you know, them trying to get a hold of like their conversation. But then, like, the way he was cutting the, the audio video, or excuse me, the audio back together to to create, like, like that sort of, like, soundtrack. It was like a soundscape, and it was haunting. And, he, you know, what the like, even just the writing, the writing of those words, that part of the script about the old man in the park, and he was a baby once. And to keep playing that over and over again, it was kind of like a poem. It was, yeah. it was pretty awesome. That, that's why it gave me also a, a stage... I feel like I thought what Marina thought and I think what Jason thought was clearly this couple found something out and they shouldn't have and they're having this kind of uh, relationship that is frowned upon as well and, uh, you know, that's why their their life is in danger, right? I mean, they do such a great job of setting that up and yeah. making us feel that. And then, yeah, it has such a great thing because it's like finally you get the hotel, the date, and the time. And it's like, oh, shit, they're going to kill them there. Right. And that flip is great. And it it's so well done compared to nowadays, how they do it. Let's say a Ocean's Eleven or a Now You See Me or Now You See Me Too or even like a Glass Onion or which, hey, I also, well, I, I really like the, you know, Glass Onion and all those kind of movies, the mysteries and the flip and the twist. But it was just done differently. It wasn't, like, now it's way more telegraphed. Or the flip is just, they put in the flip. It's not a, like, oh, there was this slight misunderstanding. It's just, we'll give you the flip because it has to have a, a flip. It has to be a shocking moment. Whereas this, it was just him mishearing the conversation. That was, it, it was just uh, not intonation because at times he's like, they're afraid, they're afraid, they're whatever. And it was just like, he misheard it. It was nothing like new, new dialogue, new everything. Because everything that was in that dialogue, we were hearing with Gene Hackman Whereas, like, all these more modern films are, like, here's a new piece of evidence or a new shot that you didn't have to begin with. Everything was in that conversation. He just misheard it. Yeah, it was really so well with me. Because I remember I got it. My husband was watching it with me. And I was like, oh, they meant. 
he would kill us too. Not he would kill us. We're so scared. No, we're gonna plan this whole mother freaking murder and we can't feel guilty about it because he would do the same. Like, and they, yep. they fooled me twice because when he, because like you said, I feel like you instantly, at least I did, you connect with Gene slash Harry to where you, everything he's going through, I feel like that makes your perception of the movie is in his eyes. Like they do a really good job of it because when he was in the bathroom bugging out while he was like um, bugging, bugging them. out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering about the dialogue. I thought he was going crazy though, because like I heard them talking, and then I heard the husband caught talking, but it wasn't like um caught you. Like it was like this like regular conversation, and then the argument, and then all of a sudden screaming. And I was like, is he going crazy at this point? Maybe nobody's even in the room, but it made sense to what happened. Cause like no guy is gonna come to the hotel because he caught his wife and be calm. Yeah, it was weird. So yeah, they tricked me twice. There were so many little um, hidden nuggets in there for you to figure it out, but I did not. Like it's very rare that a movie like blindsides me. Even even when Harrison, I you know Harrison Ford is working for the director, but he's also in on it. So that's what really sells it. Cause okay. you're thinking. Harrison Ford is the muscle, right? He's what's going to, you know, he is, you know, the director doesn't want to get involved because someone's about to get murked, you know. Wait, and, so did I miss something? Because I was going to bring that up as my follow-up. Like, why Harrison Ford called him and was like, leave this alone. What, what, how did you come to the fact that he was involved outside of maybe like once he died, it was easier to just say it was in a car accident? Or like, or do you feel like it was all, or do you feel like it was, like he was in on it from the start? Like what, what, did I miss something? Like what makes you feel like he was in on it the whole time? Just at the end. Cause there's that interview part at the end, the press conference with everyone and he's there and he's looking and stuff like that. And it's clearly above uh, Gene, Hack's, Gene Hackman's pay rate, if you will, right? Like, at that point, it's that realization, like, I'm so deep into this. I'm, I've been played. Everything I thought I knew gotcha. is completely off. So Harrison Ford had to be in it from the beginning. And whether that was, is he now kind of going to be the head? If it's going to be the woman, I imagine it's the woman, because it seems like he was the wife of the the head honcho of Robert Duvall. Um, and so I, I just feel Harrison Ford was in it. They didn't like Robert Duvall for whatever reason, because maybe he, he got a part in uh, The Godfather that was going to go to Harrison Ford originally. I don't know, you know. And so he was in on it. That's the way I see it. So what's interesting to me is, the reaction of Robert Duvall in that scene when he finds out that they have been, uh, what they've been talking about. He basically is figuring out, like, did I just hear a murder plot or whatever? And Gene Hackman doesn't know what's going on. And he's still sticking around and trying to, like, count his money and sort of sell himself. And, you know, he thinks he just did, like, a great thing or whatever. And this guy is really contemplating, like, did my own kid, is my own kid trying to kill me? You don't know that at the time that that's what he's going through. But his acting is so good, like you could feel it. You could feel like the trauma that just came on this man as he just turns around in his chair and he's like thinking of his like next move, or you know, he can't even believe what he just heard. Oh, was that a kid? I thought it was girlfriend or wife. I thought that's where it was that it was a cheating scandal. I thought that was his kid. That was his wife. Oh, that's his wife. <laughs> I definitely feel like that's his wife. Oh, okay. Why right. That, that's like it's pretty harsh to want to murder your kids. Uh, a partner, but the fact that it's like an older guy with a younger woman, yeah, there you go. That's Wait, so this is I where thought. I'm at. I was conflicted. Oh, look at that guy behind her as a forward. That's the guy right there. Um, anyway, yeah, they're killing the um, I don't know. I feel like Harrison old. Ford didn't get in on it till the end because it just made more sense to cover it up. No. 
No, they wanted they wanted the recording of them setting it up. The setup was Robert Duvall hearing the the hotel, the date, and the time, because then he was gonna gonna crash in on the cheating part of it. That was the whole point, and that's what Gene Hackman was so worried about. Like, oh, if I let this rich, you know, powerful man know that his wife is cheating on him and they're afraid of him finding out, then Robert Duvall is going to go and kill them at their meetup that they normally might meet up, you know. But instead, it was the trick all along of hoping Robert Duvall hears this tape and then he shows up there. That, that at least that's what I that that, that I saw. Jason, so, Jason, you feel like he knew it was a setup. Based I feel like said? I feel like the uh, Robert Duvall character is coming to a realization that he's being either set up or what he's hearing is it true? Because he's distraught after he listens to it. Yeah. So. The thing is, is he distraught because he's know he's being cheated on? Is he distraught because he just heard what might be a murder plot? But either way, he knows things aren't going well. I I, I think he's distraught that they, he's being cheated on. And so he's trying to figure out his next move or whatever it is. But that's why he's like, get out. I don't even want to yeah. talk to you anymore. I got new fish to fry. And that, that's why, I, at least the way I see it, that's the beauty of it. Because Gene Hackman hears the conversation over and over. And it's like, if he were in the same position, he'd kill us. Which it makes Gene Hackman assume that the moment that Robert Duvall heard this, he was going to murder them. Yeah. But clearly, so what we find... That, what? It was so well done. It really yeah. was. Because Robert Duvall, I don't think, was the killing type. And I think that's why it fits in. And I think that's why Harrison Ford must have been in it from the beginning of just the we're all in it. This guy is an old dude or old in their I'm shit. They're probably the same age. They're probably like five years probably, different. Probably that age, Robert Duvall probably did. Calling that man older. Old. <laughs> Sorry, Robert Even Duvall. Even though it's like two years before that, he was Tommy and, and the Godfather. Yeah. So, uh, Hagen. Um, so, yeah. So, I that's where I see it that Robert Duvall was never the killing type, but they played it so well of walking around in that circle, having to get the three microphones set up plus the one in the bag and just like him having to create a, in, in a puzzle, figuring out exactly just for it to be the biggest con that he's ever heard of just like, oh no, we just played you as a fool because you created the recording that then you gave to the, the mark. And, and he showed up thinking that he was just going to confront the couple for cheating on him, whereas it was just a setup to kill him. I mean, that dude had on the plastic bag and everything, like real American psycho style. <laughs> Premeditated, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. Okay, awesome. That's very interesting. See how well that was? It's so interesting that we all are still not even on 100% on the same page. Like, that's how that's how intriguing the plot was, that we could all because watch it. also it. plays with, like, flashes, doesn't it? Like, flashes of information is what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, also, it, it does, you're right. Go ahead. Also, sure. I was going to say, so, um, <clears throat> probably... Since we're, word like, word. since we're, like, essentially, like, putting a bow into this, I want to unravel certain things that I'm still a little confused about. So when, one when is, a man loves a woman <laughs> or likes her. Yeah. So <laughs> <Or> likes her. <laughs> yeah, sometimes like there is no love. All right, go, Steve. So that woman that he I guess he just met, right? That I guess slept with him. She's the one that stole the tapes, but she That's was the there, she was there sent by those people. Then, yep. Yeah, yeah. That's where that's so where I get it. How small this plot was when all this extravagant measures were taken. 
<laughs> like what we're hiring because that means they they hired the whole squad to invite him mm -hmm. over to get him drunk to make sure that he would no because that was like play. everybody was against him for an affair i don't know oh, like some, some I, of the stuff didn't really add up in that area that's where i'm not sure if everyone was that's in it because <laughs> you you know why i don't think everyone was in it because one of the guys was trying to get the girl to go with him and she was like nah i'm staying one of the guys was trying to like okay okay he, been a part of it. he's upset well yeah but it, 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 at the end of if anyone was in a, in it it was the east coast guy not uh john so i don't think any of them were in on it i think that the woman i think one of two things either she was in on it and she you know she's a spy or whatever so she got the stuff and got out of there or she didn't get steal this up at all she left in the morning or whatever but then, like, somebody else came in and got it. You might have fallen asleep at that point, but Harrison Ford, in the conversation. What? The drink every time. The conversation. Take a drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's saying a drinking game with me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Harrison Ford <laughs> says, when he talks to him, uh, to Gene Hackman, we have to do it. As in... We had to plant that girl there. Oh, okay. So, like, he... Now, he, he do you agree, Marina? spoke about it out loud. It does... It, I could see that Harrison Ford did come to the expo. So, maybe he realized, like, he saw him talking to them and then offered her money if she would do that tonight. Yep. That night, whatever. So, that makes I, more sense. Yep. And then that conversation, we we haven't even gotten into the fact. My one of my well, I have the two favorite sure. scenes that I brought up. Do you want to bring anything else up? Sure. I mean, we can talk about Dino's two favorite scenes. You what said the it's... c word. Huh? You said the c word. Oh yeah, I I didn't finish it though. I tried to stop halfway through. So. <laughs> uh... I think I know one of the scenes he's going to bring up. He's going to bring up the scene with the woman and the guy talking or whatever, which is a great scene. It's a scene. It's two very broken people having that conversation, and it felt very theater, and it was lovely. It was wonderful. What the which scene? When the scene when she's trying to talk to him and get to know him or whatever, and he's like being. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, and by that scene, I mean that whole part in the warehouse, and that's where I'm like, this can be a play. Everything can revolve around that that warehouse, right? And as a play you know, on stage, you could maybe have partitioned that off to one of them being his apartment. You know, when he goes to meet the girl, it can actually just be in his apartment. Clearly, you know, all that is logistics later. But yeah, that to me is just like what is it, 20 minutes in that space, 15 minutes in that space, and there's a party, and there's people having fun, and he's going more into his psychosis and paranoia, and this girl is trying to get him to open up, and, and that, I mean, that Terrific. is just like the meat and potatoes of the whole fucking movie. Because that's the part of the movie, it's the only part of the movie where we see groups of people talking and emoting and feeling and... They're not just being robots anymore and they're drinking alcohol and people are getting real and angry and emotional and it's the first time in the movie everything else is just like hard business yep and so for me it's that scene and then i love the end oh my god it's just paranoia and psychosis just like like everything he thought he was the best he was a little cocky there when he brought, they had a freaking motto of the park and everything and what he did. And he thought he was ahead of everyone and he was so smart. And then at the very end where he gets a call and it's just a recording of his previous conversation with Harrison Ford. And, and he just, he loses it. He loses it at to the point where he feels like he's been defeated or the acceptance of it all. And he's like, Fuck it. I'm just going to play my sax. And then you have the shot. I noticed that this time it had this panning shot that was very much exactly what at the convention center they talked about being the new gimbal whatever shot. And it was just this like panning shot as what a security camera, you know, does from the corner. And I was like, oh, I kind of noticed that. 
the first time I saw it. But. Yeah. So uh, this movie probably predicted the future in a lot of ways. I mean, it became the future, that level of surveillance for sure. We became the conversation. Okay, well, uh, I guess uh, we can go ahead and jump directly into final thoughts then. Uh, Steve, why don't you take it away? If you're still around. <laughs> final thoughts. Uh, this movie could be summarized into inside the paranoia of someone that's incredibly Catholic and is very skilled at what he does, but he is pushed into a situation where no matter the outcome, someone is going to die. I think that encapsulates a lot of the movie, right? At least the main plot idea besides the plot B and C. Oh, I don't got light anymore. No, my light turned off. Um, it's an interesting movie. Uh, really great. Uh, definitely, I agree with what Jason said in the beginning. I think in his uh, first impressions is that, uh, yeah, movies from the 70s, they just feel very different uh, from modern age or like later years because uh, the acting the environment everything is so alive uh there are some wardrobe choices that are questionable like <laughs> that raincoat looking back but uh it's a really solid movie i would definitely recommend to people that really enjoy acting and great performances and people that like old school movies it's also a really good movie that, yeah, you can have like even playing in the background and it's like nice. Because yeah, because the soundtrack is the such, such prominent. The, color, the soundtrack, but even like, let's say on mute, like just in a projector on a TV playing. Yeah. Like it's really like the scenery is really gorgeous. Like the, the cinema, cinematography wise, has an A plus from me as well. Yeah. Uh, and those are my final thoughts. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Dino, why don't you take it away? Yeah, I, man, I really like this movie. I liked it a lot. I, I mean, this, the French connection, like Gene Hackman, man, like, I feel like in today's day and age, like he's one of those forgotten, kind of like, you know, uh, John. Uh, the guy that was in The Godfather that came, and John Cavell. Yeah, Cavell. Like, I mean, John died of cancer, so that's why he stopped doing films. But Gene Hackman has some real bangers, like from back in the day till even you know more recent history. And this is one of those films that I I feel like should be talked about more often. Like every time I bring, I can bring it up, I do, because I'm just like, this is really good. It's really good character work, storytelling, music, cinematography. The raincoat is super weird because he's in the West Coast, and I think is he? Are they in California? Do they ever say where in the West Coast they are? They're they're not in that LA, are they? I mean, it would make sense if they're filming if it's Maybe LA or San Francisco. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, so the raincoat is weird if it's Southern California for whatever reason. Uh, but yeah, just really love it. Uh, even enjoyed it more this this second time around. And it's very eerie. It's very well acted. And yeah, I will continue to recommend this to people, especially now when uh, there's all the privacy stuff coming up and our phones listening to us and how much you got snowed in and all this other stuff. So this is definitely a film that now should kind of be revisited and kind of seen as like the nuance of what are you actually hearing and what are you not hearing? Maybe we should have a conversation. <laughs> Uh, 
Are you just drinking water, Steve? I've been switching drinks. Oh, night. okay, okay, okay. Uh, it's my my rookie mistake to only have one drink by me. Right. So, uh, Marina, why don't you... She went before me, huh? right? Didn't you just go, Marina? You just went. Let the women speak. No, I'm <laughs> um, so, my final thoughts are... Want to watch it again and see where I was fooled, how I was fooled, and how I'll never get fooled again by a movie. <laughs> Just want to look for more gems in the movie. Um, it's definitely one of those. I, I just, I definitely feel like if I watched it again, I'm like, oh, I should have seen it coming. Um, I really liked the beginning, the middle, and the end. Um, I kind of wish he would have found the device, but I guess they ended it more artsy. Um, with him on his saxophone. Um, something that was really sad, though, and I'm probably, it's always going to happen. It's just, I think it was more sad for me because it was the 70s, and it's not like a movie from the 40s or the 50s where you know it's inevitable. But a lot of people have passed away from this movie, and it was just really sad to see, like, even some of, like, the younger people in the movie. Um, and so it's just, like, a little, like, oh, we're getting older. The people that were young in the 70s may not be here anymore. Um, but I would recommend this movie to people who like theater. Um, I definitely, definitely feel like it was very much like a play just with like the long monologues and the way it's filmed and just like the fun in the back. Like I feel like most movies that the actors are not talking, they're not really in the scene. Um, but there's a lot of scenes where people were just having a good time in the background while other people were talking. Um, but I, I really liked it. It really made me think. It, movies always get like an extra star for tricking me. Like I'm, I'm just like a plot catcher. So it was pretty cool to get tricked every once in a while. Um, but yeah, really good pick. Real quick, Marina, do you check every movie we watch to see how many people have died from that movie? <laughs> Sometimes. Not really like something in that if we watched it from now. But I think I just so happen to look and see what other things, I'll, okay. we'll, where we'll start is to see what other things people have been in. And then okay. you can't help but see, it says their death date on IMDb. And then okay. I go in the hole, are they alive? Did you check that? Alive? Did you check that for, did you check that for Mean Girls? Uh, no, because I know they're all living <laughs> now. <laughs> Gene Hackman's still alive. I think he, he's no longer doing movies, but he's alive. I think I was looking up Stan, and um, and I was like, oh, shoot. Like, he died a couple years after this movie came out. And I'm like, who else is dead? And then I just went down. Yeah, super crazy fact. Like, the couple died the same year. I think it was, like, 2021. I was wow. like, what the heck? Yeah, it was really weird. Yeah, but no, not every movie, but yeah, it happens. Well, if, if you were looking into Stan, there's a great documentary about him because he was actually – I don't know if he was ever married to Meryl Streep, but they were together and there were roommates with Al Pacino or he was roommates with Al Pacino. It's a great documentary. So I would recommend that as a Wait, as wait, something. wait, wait. They were roommates? They they go to the same college or something? Yeah. Or or at least theater school in New York. Uh did they go to Stella Adler or they, one of those yeah, in New York? They were either in the same like school or something yep. to that effect. They got They're a sublet different. in LA. They got a sublet in Hollywood. And <laughs> yeah. What, no, but what, what that? you got a sublet in Hollywood? With that? What'd you say, Steve? I'm sorry. <laughs> Never mind. It was a joke. What, wait, what did you say? They got an apartment. They got a little studio and shared it between them three in Hollywood when they moved. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe they were doing that, but they were in New York, and I guess they knew each other in the theater scene. And uh, Meryl Streep dated him for a while, I guess. Well, a long time, or maybe even married. Is yeah, that yeah. The, before uh, yeah. the documentary is actually from two thousand nine. It's called "I Knew It Was You." I think I think she was holding his hand when he died. Yeah, and then the big thing in the documentary, they also talk about how almost very 
almost immediately after she started dating, uh, I think, an older gentleman and ended up getting married. And I was like, oh, this is crazy. But like, she's still married to that guy. So clearly it was this kind of situation where you, you, you move on or you try to find a way to, 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 yeah, to move on. And she found someone that, you know, was supportive or whatever. So she's still married to that person, but yeah, she was in this real relationship. And that was a big thing at that time. So it's a really good documentary. I'd, I'd recommend it to anyone. I mean, he wasn't in that many movies, but the ones he was in are freaking classics. They're, I think all of them are in that in the list of and top a hundred or a thousand. Nobody had a run like him. Yeah, he was like he's in four movies, but they were all like insanely good. Yeah, doesn't, um, it doesn't hurt if you're Al Pacino's uh, friend and movie? roommate. What's that? Does he have bigger roles in the other movie because we get, we get yeah. So he's the second movie. lead. He's in Dog Day Afternoon with Al Pacino. He's the second lead. Uh, he plays one of the sons in Godfather. In the first two, and so he's in both movies. He might even have flashback in the third movie, but he's in the first two movies. And then he's in... Um, the Deer Hunter Deer is Hunter. the last movie he's credited for, and that's right when he shortly after passed away. So, yeah. Yeah, all these gritty 70s movies he's a part of. He's a part of that culture of like these really hard hitting kind of 70s in your face, you know, get after it. And also in the documentary, they talk about how good of an actor he is. They, everybody said he was like an actor's actor in New York. Like actors loved him. Yeah. And he was like kind of the man. They all sort of went to him because he's a little bit older than them. Yeah. And they all kind of went to him because he was such a, you know, polished New York actor. But uh, so my final thought. My final thought is um, not that much different than my first thought, which is I really like this movie. And, you know, hearing you guys talk about it kind of opened me up to some new, um, you know, some new understandings to the film. Uh, I would recommend this movie to anyone who loves that gritty 1970s, you know, hard nose sort of, uh, you know, cinema verte type action because this thing does it. It, it, it feels like a great filmmaker or a, of someone who's becoming a great filmmaker make this movie. It's so nuanced and there's so many like little tricks in it and so much design and style and so much like, you know, theme and symbols. And so it's, it's a terrific film from Francis Ford Coppola. I'm glad I found it. Uh, I would recommend it to people who love those type of movies, people who love movies, people who are cinephiles, people who uh, love Gene Hackman, you know, uh, people who, uh, theater students, honestly, like I would have definitely watched this when I was like first studying to be an actor. If somebody would have like, Hey, look at this, you know, especially a lot of the acting without, you know, people doing talking, you know, that yeah. stuff's like super great in this film. Cause it's like these characters are live film students. Yeah. Film students need to watch this thing. Cause this thing, you know, does some really interesting stuff, you know, as far as like storytelling. Um, yeah. So this is a, a great film. Highly recommend it. Really liked it. I will revisit it again. I will revisit it one day with the same uh, uh, antithesis that Marina said that she would have in trying to uh, see can you realize or see what you missed when you watch it again. Um, you know, see if you can put it together now knowing what you know. Uh, yeah, so great film. Um, I guess I only have one more question. Uh, and that's, uh, Steve, what do you got for us next week? Next week, I don't know why you. Oh, oh, I don't know why you ask me, because it is not my turn. It is someone that's extremely close to you. Too close. <laughs> it is my turn. Um. So yeah, it's uh, the Fisher King. The Fisher King. Ah, with Robin Williams. And Jeff Bridges. And somehow I've never seen it. I might have, maybe I've seen clips. I've definitely seen clips of it, but I've never seen it. Um, I've never seen it as an actual movie. I've seen it's it. Like a great, it's like a great, like a great anti Jason and Marina. Like, bye. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Wait, anti Jason Amar? Oh, I get it. Yeah. Well, we don't like Robbie Williams? No, it said, uh, we are mirrored, but what they are seeing is me and, and Steve. Gotcha. Correct. I agree with you, Steve. <laughs> so for El Dandino, Jason Echoes, Marina, and me, Steve, Dusty B. We'll catch you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.